that move from Flash to HTML, they literally said to one million users, you know, fuck you, because we're not going to support you anymore. I told myself, Adam, you've reached that point in life and in your career where if you can't exercise your freedom to speak your mind and to deal with some pushback, then what's it all for? Does it hurt you to lose money when you lose? It's less about losing money and much more about extinguishing that dream. And also feeling a little bit of empathy for the entrepreneur who put their real heart into it. Do you like still enjoy going to board meetings? Do you find them useful? No. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a long time to have confidence. I have a lot of self-doubt uh, of what I'm doing at any given moment in time. It took me many, many exits to feel like, okay, I think I've got this done now. Welcome back to Invested. I'm actually thrilled to have Adam Fisher with me. Uh, I'm telling Adam a story he doesn't even know yet. Uh, but Adam is a partner at Bessemer, and I'll have him introduce himself in a second. But uh, when I set out to set up Olive, I asked an LP who became our anchor LP, uh, who should I consider for a partner? And there were two names on the list. One is Aiden Shohat, who's my current partner, and the other is Adam Fisher. And so uh, we didn't partner up on the fund, but we'll partner up on the podcast, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Adam, tell everyone about you. About me? I typically start with the fact that I was born in South Africa, which surprises people because I don't have a South African accent. I left at the age of four with my parents who took me to the United States. And so I grew up in the U.S., formative years, uh, and then moved to Israel immediately after completing university. Uh, I'm a venture capitalist, a partner at Bessemer Venture Partners, and I've been in venture capital for the last 26 years. Where'd you grow up in the United States? Initially in Cleveland, Ohio, and then in San Antonio, Texas. How did your family get to San Antonio, Texas? Well, that was family. We were following family at that point. And, uh, and Cleveland was, my father's a physician, went to the Cleveland Clinic to finish his, uh, or to do his residency, and then joined up with family who had moved to San Antonio. I think a lot of South Africans moved to uh, Southern California and, uh, and South Texas, Houston, San Antonio. It was a similar standard of living. Really? And why'd you move to Israel after college? Good old-fashioned Zionism. Uh, I answer the same way, so I, I get it. But right, I I think as a uh, as a um, South African Jew in particular, it was Zionism was very very strong in the community throughout the generations, and so I grew up uh, hearing a lot about Israel. My father had actually moved here as a child with his parents and his family in the early 1960s. Uh, it didn't work out for them. Was a the, at the time the country was actually experiencing a, a deep deep recession. 1963, 64. So they moved back. Uh, but if I, if I go every generation back, there's somebody else who actually moved here and, and didn't make it. My great-grandfather moved here uh, from Poland. My uh, grandmother uh, was, was born here. I can go further back, even to 1898. Uh, a direct ancestor of mine left South Africa, moved to the Holy Land. Uh, I have a document, actually, that, that was sent from his uh, shul, from his synagogue, uh, wishing him well. And I love that uh, date, 1898, because actually 100 years later, I made Aliyah in 1998. Wow. And so uh, I'm the first generation, I think, to succeed since, since that great ancestor. And I, he, I lost trace of him. Like he, 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 I think he lived and died here, but I don't know what happened. How old was he when he came? He was, he was an adult. His, his children, he left his children in South Africa. Yeah. Wow, we left his children behind in South Africa yeah. and moved to the Holy Land to Jerusalem? I don't know. Like you're asking me, it's it's too long ago to to dig that far back. You're talking about uh, five, six generations back. It's not something like you were an investor in my heritage, right? Which is the you couldn't find them on my heritage. No, no, no. There's a lot. There's still a lot that you can't find. My heritage is a place uh, primarily for for documenting uh, what what is known, um, and then finding research to back it up. But it's it's actually quite difficult, in, in particular with Jewish communities around that time. Um, so I have a lot that's documented, but not that. But what is his name? Like if someone's listening to this podcast and they hear his name, maybe there's somebody out there who says, oh, I know who that guy was. It was Moshe or Morris or Moses Magid. Um, I always start off by asking, what, what are your core values? So what are your core values? As an investor or as a person? It's an open question. Well, that's a core value question. Um, I believe in being genuine. I think it's really important. Some people call that transparency. Some people call it uh, um, honest. But I, I, it comes through for me in what I call intellectual honesty. 
Um, I think that's kind of a core value of mine. Intellectual honesty is different from from honesty because it's about truth uh, with yourself. You know, honesty is what I'm talking to you. Of course, I also believe in honesty, but intellectual honesty is something different. It's a truth within yourself. It's actually accepting yourself, understanding yourself, um, and uh, and that helps me a lot in you know, everything else, how I interact with people, how I make decisions. I think I once heard from you in a conversation, and we can cut we can cut if you don't want me to talk about it, that you are an introvert. Um, can you define what that means? Yeah, there's no reason to cut that. Yeah. Right? I'm, there's, no, there's no shame. An introvert is somebody who... Uh, who actually gets uh, more satisfaction uh, uh, in spending time uh, with, let's just call it fewer people, or even on his own. Uh, uh, it could be reading, it could be exercising, and, and gets a lot, of, a lot more out of that than being surrounded by many people. Um, and an extrovert, in contrast, needs other people uh, to feel alive, to feel active. And... When I think about most of the venture capitalists, they know I find most of them to be extroverts. It's not that there aren't people who are introverts. Well, it's because you're going to conferences. You're going to meet other extrovert venture capitalists. You know, my partner Peter Fenton at Benchmark never went to a conference. I'd say he was closer to an introvert, but he felt like an extrovert. It's certainly around the table. Look, it's it's ultimately it's a spectrum. Yeah, right? it's not it's not binary. Um, and I think uh, I think most venture capitalists need to have the ability to turn themselves into extroverts. Uh, sometimes it requires a beer or two, uh, but we're all capable of it. If not, we weren't we weren't going to succeed. You know, anybody who gets on stage needs to have some ability to take on an extrovert uh, persona. But I would also say the opposite. I think those who are extroverts also need to be able to spend time with themselves, to right. think carefully about what they need to do what, when they're making an investment, when they need to uh, engage an entrepreneur or somebody else in a tough conversation that that's time with yourself it's not teamwork it's it, it's you and then you, and then it's you and one person that's much more of a any kind of one-on-one type environment that's that's where introverts are can i um, assume you don't go to conferences what's that <laughs> so how do you like this is a networking business like how do you meet people if you don't get out and go to conferences and you want to be with yourself like how does that work you know a lot of people a lot of people know you Right. Well, I, I think at any point in your career, you need to decide what, what you need to focus on. I, I Personally, I don't feel like I'm at that point in my career where I want to con- continuously expand my network. Mm-hmm. There's value in that, don't get me wrong. But it, it always comes at the expense of something else, perhaps just considering, thinking, writing thoughts down, uh, again, engaging with, with the entrepreneurs I back or with my colleagues. Uh, there are other ways of reaching out to people, and it's usually in one-on-one or or smaller settings, smaller gatherings. Did you ever go to conferences? Yes, you did. I just never understood those people that would collect the Lanier's as kind of a, you know, as as a prize for themselves. And uh, and when I do go to conferences, and I do occasionally go to conferences, I'm usually you know last one to arrive, first one to leave. Uh, I come for speaking engagements, of course, um, but less just to do deal with chit chat. That's one other thing about introverts. They don't really like talking about the weather and sports and chit chat. It's like they want to get to business. Aiden says that in our partnership, I'm responsible for all the small talk. There's a place for that. <laughs> I, you know, there's absolutely a place for that. I think it's a great icebreaker. It's a, it's also a, an important skill uh, in our world. Uh, and ultimately, I think you know you will probably also in, uh, connect uh, more closely, perhaps, with entrepreneurs who are like you in that sense, who are also extroverts. In my sense, I feel like I connect more people who are slightly more introverted. Interesting. On your LinkedIn bio, it says that you write more poetry than code. For me, that's easy. The last line of code I wrote, I think, was either in the seventh or eighth grade. When was the last line of code that you wrote? Yeah, that was just mostly just to emphasize the fact that I'm, I don't have a technology background. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about that in a second. I don't, I, I've never really written code except for l- trying to figure out how to build a website back in the late 90s with some HTML. But did you write uh, poetry? I do. I do write poetry. Uh, these days, I mostly write uh, poetry for my for my children. Essentially, every birthday since I think the age of five, uh, since, my, my, since my eldest turned five, I've written a poem for their birthday, and that's how the birthday celebration begins. And do the every kids year, like find the celebratory to read a poem? I just want to be absolutely because they what don't I, want a present; I, they want a poem. No, like they get they get presents too. Oh, okay. But the poem, like they, they, I, at this point, my problem is I've done it so. I've done it every year that they expect nothing less. And let me tell you something, trying to find something new 
uh, to talk about about your child and their and their last year every year with different language and and different rhymes is an incredible challenge and somehow I'm able to pull it off. So and, like I, I love it actually when this, I'm finished. <laughs> this is a skill. So it, how long are each of these poems? It's the uh, I mean each one is like a you know ten font one page. I'm trying to get it onto one page so I can read it. You know it's a good uh, fifteen stanzas probably. Yeah. Wow. And. And how long before the birthday do you start writing? I tried to cram it. This is I don't I don't always recommend cramming for for other things, but but something like a poem where there's you know the perfection is is a dangerous thing to to obtain. You, you've got to rely on time, and so I generally start twenty four to thirty six hours before. And do you collect like anecdotes and tidbits throughout the year? Not throughout the year. No, no. maybe in the few days prior. <laughs> But do you remember the whole year? Like, like how much of the year does the poem capture? It tries to capture all the memorable moments and the changes in their lives. And how many uh, kids do you have? Year? Two. Two. And you write both of them a poem? On their birthday. On their birthday, I understand. Birthdays. Yeah, not, not both of them on each one of their birthdays. Yeah, did your yeah. wife get a poem? She occasionally gets a poem. <laughs> but that is, it's, it's just too much. <laughs> all right. Now, speaking of writing, like since October 7th, like you've turned up on Twitter. Is that fair to say? Yes. Uh, your presence is going, you've written some, what I consider to be epic threads, for example, on Ireland and and uh, and other places. What caused you to kind of come out onto Twitter, which is an extrovert kind of thing, I guess, um, and start to be so vocal? And by the way, I think so in, incisive too. Well, I mean, I love that platform. It's actually perfect for, for introverts that aren't afraid of expressing their opinion. And, uh, introverts are not closed off from the world. They just, again, they, do, they just don't get activated by those media interactions. Um, it allows me to express my thoughts and opinions uh, with those that are interested in hearing it. I woke up like everybody else on the morning of October 7th uh, to, you know, to, to air raid sirens and realized very quickly that this is, this is highly unusual. Um, if it's not a mistake, it's it's not the way I would expect um, a, 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 an attack to to start, meaning in the central region of of Israel. And so I immediately actually got onto Twitter X to figure out what is really going on. Um, and I did searches, the kind of searches you probably, in retrospect, kind of don't want to do to figure out what what are they saying out there. And I immediately encountered some of the worst images, the very first images um, that were out there that were being grabbed from tele Telegram channels and put onto to X. And I realized this is this is actually massive. And so within, I think by about 7.30, I made it clear to my followers that this is actually the beginning of a war. We might not know it yet, but it's the beginning of a war. Um, and I realized that at that point in time that I wanted to just express myself of both how serious this is uh, uh, for the moment, but also in terms from a historical perspective. And from that point, I also began to realize that what's happening, the response, meaning those who are anti-Israel, um, was uh, was also incredible. Uh, it was uh, immediately what looked to me being support for the elimination of Israel, support for for terrorist organizations, um, and I realized this was going to be there was going to be two kind of wars taking place here: the real war um, and the information war, and that is modern warfare. It's an asymmetry that we think we're familiar with, but we're not, uh, and. Uh, in some ways, like citizens are also soldiers from the asymmetric war of trying to get information out there. Um, my goal was not to convince anybody who hated Israel to suddenly love Israel. It's impossible to do, but rather to equip those who their instincts are with Israel to uh, to have the information they may not otherwise have, who aren't as well read or well informed, uh, and to help give them the kind of ammunition, so to speak to both explain to themselves why they support Israel and they're necessary also to tell others. I asked Ariel Sturman, who is your partner at Bessemer, like, what should I ask you? And one of the things she said was, uh, has there been any pushback, number one, or number two, how does it feel to share your point of view out there? Uh, you're in a partnership. It's a big partnership. You're in an international partnership, which I'm not in. Um, has it had any impact internally, externally, uh, from a fund basis? And did you have any hesitancy um, to get your views out there because of your position 
in the firm? No, so the quick answer is no, absolutely not. Um, my my par- partners are fully behind uh, me and, and Israel, no hesitation whatsoever. Um, you asked me before about what maybe come out. You know, I didn't I didn't mention it before, but I, my my first coming out politically was actually um, in December of twenty two um, against the the so called ref- judicial reform here. And it was at that time that I told myself, you know, Adam, you've reached that point in life and in your career where if you don't exercise your your if you can't exercise your freedom to speak your mind and to deal with some pushback, then what's it all for? Uh, and so the same thing here. I realize that, you know, there may be some price to pay and my partners may get some pressure, um, but I think that's a price I'm willing to pay. Uh, because again, if we as, in, as venture capitalists, independently successful, can't do it, well, then who can? Um, and so that's what I've done. I know it's also inspired others, which was not my intention, uh, but that's also the reason I continue to do so. Give me some people who it's inspired. Well, people who have told me that they were inspired <laughs> by it. They've, they've told me that they, a lot of people um, are in a position, unfortunately, where they don't feel comfortable speaking out. Yeah, I agree. Uh, they, they're in companies where, even if they're the CEO um, or the main investor, they, they, they feel like it's just, it's just not worth it uh, because the blowback will be so hard it will have been uh, counterproductive. And so, again, we have to then speak out also on their behalf and compensate for that relative silence, which is unfortunate, but I also completely understand it. Does it bother you at all when, I've, I've, I looked at some of the comments on a much year mm-hmm. uh, ex posts and some are pretty nasty. Actually, many are very nasty. <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't see nearly as much as I have. I mean, it's- <laughs> I'm certain that that's true. Unreal. I mean- uh, And how do you think about that? Like, first of all, does it get to you at all? No, well, no. The, no. The, the, okay. the, you know, the, the real crazies, like the total neo-Nazis, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I laugh. Uh, I think when I did that one post on, on Spain in particular, that was the, that was the, that was the most bizarre. If anyone's have, listening, you need to go scroll Adam's timeline to read the posts, both on Spain and on Ireland. They're excellent. Yeah. On the, so the, the Spanish one was interesting because I was, I was pressing Google translate on all these, they were all posts in Spanish. Uh-huh. Um, it was just fascinating that like they would be so well-versed in anti-Semitism 500 years later. Uh, but they knew everything, um, and uh, and it just lives on. And so, it, yeah, I mean, does it affect me? Only in the sense that I knew this was always there, uh, that latent anti-Semitism. Uh, and, uh, you know, in some ways, I'm, I'm glad it's out. Like, I, I just, that's, that's, that's the truth. Does this have uh, anything to do with, like, when you think, I, I know it's hard to kind of do a retrospective. Um, you said earlier that it was a Zionism that caused you to move to Israel. Did you, did you think that anti-Semitism was latent, you know, either through your college experience or uh, any other experiences growing up that caused you to think, hey, I'm going to go to Israel, won't, won't be anti-Semitic? Um, yes. I mean, the, an- the answer is yes. Where'd you go to college? Georgetown. Georgetown. And you felt it there? I did. I mean, I encountered it for the first time truly uh, at university. It's a Jesuit university, uh, which is uh, which is Catholic. Um, now they themselves are actually, you know, very welcoming and, uh, and also connected to Israel, but at Georgetown, there's a very large Arab studies program, which for years was, uh, funded by problematic, um, sources. Um, they once even took money from, from, from Libya when it was slander Gaddafi. They actually had to, were forced to give it back, but that just gives you a sense of who was running the show there again, at this program. And so I encountered a lot of, you can call it anti-Zionism, but it was very, it was very clear. It was, it came from a much deeper uh, place and uh, from a a kind of, I wouldn't say religious angle, but uh, it it, it wasn't simply about uh, the modern state of Israel. When I uh, interviewed Sam Lesson, who tried to get on the Harvard Board of Overseers uh, recently and has been trying to uh, figure out how to take Harvard back uh, from, uh, the, the forces that have taken over Harvard and the, the anti-Semitism there and other things. I asked him if he thought it was redeemable and whether college campuses were. He said he wasn't sure, basically, um, but that it was an important fight to fight. Do you think these college campuses that have taken money over all these years from somewhat nefarious sources are, are redeemable at this point? 
I didn't have it. I went to Yeshiva I, University. Right. I, I think so. By the way, I don't think the source of the funding is a problem because you could easily, I, it, it could be, could very well be that many of these universities have most of their money actually from, you know, much more liberal minded or yeah. even Jewish sources. So I don't think it's a source of the money that's a problem. I think it's something rotten in academia. Um, something rotten about the tenure system, which was not supposed to work that way. It was supposed to allow people to have their own opinions and and to do their own work and research without uh, interference from administration or from donors. But in this case, it led to a certain level of, of groupthink where tenured uh, pro- professors would be in the selection committees that would essentially grant tenure or 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 or, or not just just uh, positions to be like-minded people. Um, over the last twenty years. There are many more opportunities for for intelligent, well-spoken uh, people who want to do things, right? In the private sector, even in private research uh, organizations, um, in government. Those who stuck to academia, um, uh, they're, I think they're of a, of a, of a certain uh, typecast, um, kind of made from a certain cloth. And I think what you're, what you're seeing is, is that come out. And it just t- typically, not just in the United States, but uh, across the world, it's, uh, it's extreme left. There's no tenure at Bessemer, right? No. There's no tenure at Olive either. And it makes me wonder, I just candidly, I keep wondering about systems where the meritocracy goes out the window at some point, whether then the goal becomes, hey, I got to get to this point, and then, like, I don't need to earn our merit anymore. I can just be there. Um, I once thought that about, like, founding partners of venture firms who had, a, you know, an, an unlimited tenure. Yeah. Do you think that there's room for kind of a more market-based system in universities or this tenure thing is important? I mean, the, th- the thinking of tenure is a person should be able to express their own view. You said before, my success enables me to express my own view. Um, what What's the best way to kind of get to some real pursuit of the truth or ability for people to speak out and be free? Well, I think people in universities feel, they, they feel free to speak out Um Again, I just think the faculty has now just been, it doesn't represent the broad spectrum of views in, in the country. It, been it, captured. Yeah, yeah, it's been captured. Uh, and of course, they also teach students in a certain way. I just remember myself being in, in university. And now I was I was well-read and I understood how to make sense of what, what the professors were saying if I felt that they were had clearly had an anti-Israel agenda. And I took it in stride and I found it you know fascinating. I just didn't think about... Uh, it is a form of of, of propaganda. Uh, look, you can make the same argument about somebody who's who's very right wing teaching university. I think there's there's, there's room for for uh, for a diversity of views. The problem is that lack of diversity. Um, I don't know if there's a market way to go about it, but I, I I do think that there should be some balance in the types of people who are educating the next generation. I want to make a sharp turn. Um, so I'm speaking to somebody who, on some level, has a similar background to me, right? Which is, we both grew up in the States. We both went to college in the States. We both moved to Israel right after college, and we we're both in venture capital for uh, more than two and a half decades. So that's a pretty parallel path. Um, you've done very well. You've been very impactful. We even invested in a couple of companies together. Do um, you think there's something about that path, like growing up in a bigger economy in a bigger country? And then applying the skill in a smaller country, it gives you a different perspective, uh, maybe a unique angle on investing that's made you a better investor. Well, we're both immigrants. Yes. And I think immigrants and entrepreneurs have something in common. You know, it's not a coincidence that a lot of entrepreneurs in the U.S. are, are immigrants. I think there's something about being an outsider that makes you a better observer of the world and a, and a better innovator, better, better position to, to innovate. And I think both of us coming here there's some aspect of being entrepreneurial in that sense, taking some risk. Uh, I think obviously going back to the U.S., our company's focus on the U.S. market. That's a huge advantage, not just language and culture, but also being able to travel back and forth. It's an advantage to our Israeli peers. I mean, culturally to be able to travel back and forth, basically. It's not Col- just a passport issue. It's a, no, it's not yeah. a passport issue. <laughs> uh, it, it feels like our home. We yeah. don't, we're, you know, we're, we're, we were advising our companies and they see us as as locals there, even though we're locals here. Uh, I would say that we, we both did it also without much of a career before. Right. And uh, and that was unusual at the time. And so we had to kind of forge our way at a time when the industry was very, very young. Um, it didn't really know what it what it didn't know. 
uh, those who were experienced had two to three more years experience than we did. Uh, those and a decade were, and a half plus of age. At least. And, yeah. and you know, I always believe that your, your past, you know, certainly informs your present in good ways and bad ways. A lot of the people who were uh, the first kind of crop of VCs, they were, they were former execs, not so much at startups, but rather at, at larger companies. And that doesn't necessarily lend itself to working with entrepreneurs. Uh, so we started with a clean slate, and that allowed us both to decide who to emulate. Uh, we met a lot of American venture capitalists. We learned their kind of the secrets of the trade, so to speak. These days, it's all public and, and on blog yeah. posts and, and, and Twitter. But back in the day, it took effort to figure out exactly how it was supposed to work. And what do you think is kind of the core trait that turns you into a very successful venture capitalist? In my case, it's accepting the uncertainty of business, but also uh, of life, and figuring out the right mental framework that's going to allow you to move forward, that's going to allow you to embrace that uncertainty. There's a lot of risk uh, in starting a business. There's a lot of risk in funding a business. Uh, and I think the ability to find the way forward, find some the justification to move forward is, is what propels us. Um, and I say it that way because our business also requires you know, we have to be dreamers, but we also have to be skeptics, right? Yeah. Otherwise, we'll invest in everything and we'll lose the, the, the fun very, very quickly. So the default is skepticism. It's like, this is not going to work. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. But at the same time, we have to have a framework for moving forward, for seeing an opportunity and seizing it. Did you say that, by the way? Because I agree that the framework is both what you call dreamer, I would call optimism, I often refer to it as if this goes right and this goes right and this goes right and that goes right, then we have a big outcome. Um, and skepticism. I have the same framework, but I tilt the other way, which is my default is optimism uh, and dreaming. And then I poke holes from the skepticism. And uh, I think that works. <laughs> it's fine. It's just interesting. You know, Clearly, I, it's worked for you. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, uh, Aiden often kind of, you know, uh, and now Tomer kind of look at it and say, but, 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 like, where's the data? And I say, I think it can work. <laughs> so I'm a bit more like you in that sense of also of not relying so much on data. I think those who come with an engineering background, uh, they they look for data as a source of of truth. And I think uh, I think data is a bit of an illusion. It can be an, an illusion. It's uh, it's a fact, but it's not truth. It's something about the past. It's not doesn't tell you about the future. Uh, and I've seen this over and over, even in the early stages. There can be a company. With, with evidence, but if you dig, you, in, you can, in a certain way, you can present those facts, good numbers, to tell whatever story you wanted to tell. And you have to be very aware of that. And so uh, I prefer to be a skeptical first <laughs> and then try and figure out how to justify it. And sometimes it's with the numbers and other times it's despite the numbers. Do you think venture capital is a skill? It's, it's not a one skill. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a skill set. There are a lot of skills involved in venture capital. Uh, especially our type of active early stage investing, where you truly partner with entrepreneurs, you're on the board, you're often, the, if not the first investor, you're also, in our case, like the largest investor. Uh, a lot of skills and working with the entrepreneur, working with co-investors, understanding markets, uh, being able to make quick decisions, but also having patience. Uh, so it's an incredible set of skills and a lot of balancing work. Does it hurt you to lose money when you lose? It's less about losing money, I'll be honest, and much more about uh, extinguishing that dream of, uh, you know, you really wanted to see that product be successful or have an impact. That, that's much more painful to me than having lost money uh, and also feeling a little bit of empathy for the entrepreneur who obviously lost much more, who put their real heart into it. I've told myself, I don't know if it's true that if it doesn't work out, it's best that the entrepreneur figure this out quickly, even though they had a dream, because their time and kind of cycles are far more important than both the capital and the idea itself. If they're going to be, you know, a good entrepreneur can kind of reinvent himself and find something else to do. Um, I'm not sure that's always true, what I just said now, right? Which is there's some people are just married to an idea and it's like their life passion and life project. I just met someone like that earlier today. Uh, I don't think that the idea has a lot of merit, but I think the person does. Look, there's something to be said about perseverance. It's also yeah. an incredible trait, and sometimes it's absolutely necessary for success. There are stories of startups and entrepreneurs that had they not continued at it, despite what everybody said, uh, you know, there's no way it would have been a success. 
Uh, and there are others where I agree with you. Like my message to the entrepreneur is, look, this is not going anywhere, but you've, you're full of ideas and, and you're going to re- create another company and it's going to be massively successful. You're not going to remember this company. I've often thought of you as like a contrarian, like you were running around semiconductors when nobody else was uh, for a long time. I, I want to talk about another view that you've held for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I had a recent expost about it uh, on Bitcoin, <laughs> right? So Bitcoin took a big drop. Uh, and you posted, I think, alongside a chart of gold, which is going up and to the right, and said, you see? Uh, it's about gold. By the way, Bitcoin's made a U-turn. Since, and then by the time the podcast comes out, I can make another U-turn again. Uh, it's it's highly volatile, but it, but it's obviously come back. Where Where is your anti-Bitcoin sentiment from? Well, it started with anti-crypto. I didn't like the grift. I didn't like the speculation. I didn't like the claims that... Uh, it was decentralized, that it was a store of value, that it was like a currency, because in each case you could, or that it was anonymous, because in each case, the, you know, you can ask a different person in crypto and they would tell you, well, actually, it's not anonymous because we can, we, can, we can track it. And they'd say, uh, well, it's, not, it's decentralized, but actually to, to get on in the first place, it's, it's centralized. Uh, or, there'll be a, or that there are whales who own, you know, somebody owns incredible amounts and can swing markets. Um, my, my comment on the, on the gold thing was against the store of value. It's not supposed to act like that. If it's like gold, obviously it can go back up. Um, I actually think Bitcoin will continue to go up. I think it's the one asset that is, that has the most potential. I was, so it was much more against the other types of, of crypto at the time. The speculation really got to me. And those advocating for it were almost always (laughs) self-interested. Actually, they were always self-interested. And that, that bothered me in particular because it was tied up with what I felt is uh, is not just personal interest, but uh, but a certain kind of ideology of supplanting the current system. Uh, and um, you know, I know as venture capitalists, our role is to figure out what couldn't go right. Right, always ask that question, uh, and it's somebody else's problem to think of what can go wrong. But I think at some point we also have to ask ourselves what can go wrong. And in this case, I saw both. I could see what can go right. But what could go right is also what could go wrong, meaning if it indeed would supplant you know, the, the current system uh, where there's no longer an interest rate set by the government because everybody's trading in these virtual currencies or the stock market was like irrelevant, that is not a world I wanted to live in. And so that's how I reached that conclusion that it's not for me. Why not? Why don't you want to live in that world? It's a world that was essentially uh, seeded and, uh, and capitalized by those that already had capital or took, or took kind of not not fair risk early on, buying up an asset, using advertisements to to run it up, and now they own a certain percentage of some type of a coin. Um, and that being an asset, I, I just don't I just don't think that's a fair system. It's just it's another feudal type of system where the early ones all all of a sudden have uh, have power over others. And again, it's it's a it's a it's a currency. it's it's a it's a finite currency. It's not a, it's not a stock that that um, um, but isn't that, that true represents- like in everything? Like, so there were the early oil barons and the er- early railroad barons, and then there was the beers and diamonds, and there was, you know, Rio Tinto and mining, and you've got all these people who discovered something, found something. Yep. By the way, the Emiratis and the Saudis, you know, by luck of geography, you know, they ended up on top of a large part of the or- world's oil reserves, and the Qataris, the tiny Qataris, who are causing a lot of mess in the world right now, landed on a giant gas reserve that they share with the Iranians. And so inevitably, there are people either by luck of geography or dint of geography, by dint of uh, innovation, by dint of just good luck or whatever it is, turn up at the beginning of an asset uh, cycle or an innovation cycle and, and own a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't agree with those analogies. I mean, oil was not in, in, in one place. Nobody thought they had cornered the, the oil market earlier. They didn't create the oil market. Oil also had another purpose beyond just uh, an, uh, an, an appreciating asset. Um, it was only worth something because it actually was was needed. I mean, we found more use for oil over time, which increased its demand and made it much more valuable. And it's just, it takes time to dig oil wells. There ends up always being a lag, at least in the early parts of the market, between uh, demand no, and No, I'm all for, for free markets. But, but like, just, even, even Bitcoin, right, has, if you're in Venezuela today or Argentina and you want to get your money out, which, is, you know, these are oppressive uh, regimes in Venezuela and they were inflationary regimes in Argentina until Mele turned up. Um, you know, it was a way to get your money out. That's a, that's a valuable use case. It is. I don't, don't think that Bitcoin was bid up because people wanted to help Venezuelan refugees. <laughs> that's fair. 
Um, in the same way, probably oil wasn't created, it wasn't found initially, so it could run automobiles. No, it it it, it wasn't automobiles, but right. uh, but you know, Engines. yeah, they, they they found they found a purpose for it. Yeah, I, yeah. look, that's it's not about unfair. And diamonds, like, like think about diamonds. Like, what's the value of a diamond? It's like, you know, we created a system called carrots, and we created a, you know a perfect and a color and whatever it is. It's a narrative around a diamond. Like you can make them in labs today, and they're the same. And so they are, but they're not, as you know, like they're not valued the same as real diamonds. Right. But why? Because mm -hmm. it's a story. Because I want a natural diamond. It's just a story. I mean, I hate to quote Yuval Noah Harari on this because I'm not a big fan, but you know, there is a story around a lot of these things. Why is a Nike sneaker worth more than the same identical sneaker? You know, it's sold at Costco because there's a story around. They're a brand. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not, I, I just don't think it is. If, if, if diamonds were the way in which we interacted going forward, we tra transacted, that would be a problem. Uh, it was for a long time. Like people would, you know, sew their diamonds into their underwear and, you know, use them to trade. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think crypto will continue to exist. I, I fear a world in which crypto dominates our society. It's mm -hmm. not so much that it exists at all. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one that advocates for, for, for banning it. Um, but it was reaching a, a crescendo where to me, it just seemed dangerous. People were plowing all of their savings into these virtual coins and mm -hmm. NFTs. And it, there's a lot of, very unhappy people around the world who who bought into this because it's in the news now. So you know, and it's like in the, I don't know, it's not in the same category as uh, crypto is controversial. But I feel like I want to ask you: Have you, have you followed this Pavel Durov story? A little, yeah. Yeah, the guy who's invested going into into France. I don't know any of the specifics of the case. I want to ask like a more meta question, which is: You've got people today like you know Pavel and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, and I'm not comparing them anymore. I'm just saying there's individuals in the world today with a lot of power to influence people because they have platforms that are used by billions of people. Um, and how do you think about the interaction between states on the one hand, um, and it's just come out, for example, this morning, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg penned a letter to Congress basically saying, hey, uh, I was influenced by the Biden administration uh, to take down posts about COVID that, you know, undermine the government's policy and to cover up Hunter Biden. It's a laptop thing. How do you think about this balance right now or this complex issue right now between these kind of mega CEOs and founders and platforms versus states? I, I worry about state interference. I do. Uh, I worry about anything labeled as uh, misinformation. Um, that is a slippery slope. Uh to government or bureaucratic control, um, that's something we should be, you know, very wary of. At the same time, you know, in the case of Telegram, for instance, um, they are much more lax in what they allow on their platform or how they proactively stop things. Uh, and as you know, that's the preferred channel for terrorist groups, for drug traffickers, for pedophile rings, and for good reason. It's fully encrypted. It's not domiciled in any country. Um, and you can reach kind of anybody. Um, that is problematic. I don't know what the answer is. Um, I'm, I don't know whether I support or am against his arrest. I don't haven't seen the yeah. arrest warrant. I don't think any of us know exactly what's going on. But the idea that um, they have zero responsibility is also problematic to a certain extent. Um, I don't know where <laughs> where that where you know where I would put it down. It's a it's a it's a dilemma that I think is going to characterize our society for, for decades to come. I'm just not an absolutist in, in either way. I'm probably more scared about government control than uh, complete decentralization um, and so-called anarchy. At the same time, uh, I can understand governments who are aware of something or have you know, access to information where, where there's a missing link and they know it's there, using all means to get it. Um, we know that conversations are tracked by the by the NSA, right? We we know that, and we're probably safer as a society. Now, at the same time, that also kind of scares me, right? Freaks me out. Um, as Snowden pointed out, uh, it's a balancing act. It's uh, I I I guess I would trust that in an open system, um, a non concentrated governmental system, that it works. There'll be there'll be situations in which the government overreaches, but there'll be pushback. I think that's inevitable and, and probably healthy. Um, As someone who uh, had to, on some level, watch the Hamas videos after October 7th, um, something I'll never probably fully recover from, um, they came in over Telegram 
And initially I said to myself, and then there were, some of them were reposted on Twitter uh, in the early days until they got kind of banned. Um, I vacillated myself between this notion of, oh my God, people need to see what happened. It's good that Telegram existed for them to get this out because it's not what Hamas had in mind, but the world needed to see this to, oh my God, that's terrible that there was a way to broadcast this this horror and the suffering of people. Um, and I wonder how you think about that. Like this notion of open because we got to see it and open gives people a chance to terrorize people and oppress them. Yeah, well, they put on Telegram what they wanted to put on Telegram. Uh, clearly. So a lot of the footage that we've seen was not put on their Telegram. Right. It was captured by CCTV yep. um, and GoPros that never made it back mm -hmm. to Gaza That's right. for obvious reasons. Um, and so at that point, yes, I'm in favor of, of, of sharing it, uh, uh, because I think it shows the, the sheer horror of these atrocities, which are just unfathomable. So I'm, I'm in favor of that. Am I in favor of Hamas having a right to, to distribute content? No, I think that's, that serves their interest. That is their, that's how they recruit. That's how they fundraise. That's how they show their success. Yeah. I think if they hadn't shown it shown it, they would have been seen as, as it would have been seen as a failed operation. I mean, they planned to take over, you know, for, for weeks, they planned to go deeper into Israel. They would have seen as a failure. So Telegram essentially helped them, uh, with propaganda, showing it as a success. So again, making a hard right turn, you were an early investor in Wix, which I was fortunate to join you in, uh, a very early investor in Fiverr, became household names, these two. Uh, around the world. What are kind of your core lessons, and particularly from these two, because they, they become really branded household names. Um, and and why? what about these two spoke to you? Like I mentioned before, you, yeah, I've always admired the fact that you have this uh, interest in semiconductors, even though you don't have a technological background. Uh, I wish I could, I could understand it enough to go invest there. Uh, but these two names are like, you know, they're brands right now. And so what attracted you to them? What do you think you did to propel them and why are they important? So they're quite different, even though they were both very early stage when I came in, I was the first venture investor. In the case of Wix, I, had, I saw two things that I really had not seen before in Israeli companies. Uh, the first was uh, this marketing angle that they had. They were doing things that I'd never seen before, well in advance of release of the product, of how to create everything from buying their URL, a three-letter URL, uh, back in 2007, um, but also various sites that were kind of build, going to build their SEO and just already thinking about paid acquisition, which is something that I was, again, I was not very familiar with. That was fresh and that to me felt like somebody who was really thinking far ahead. The second thing I saw, and this actually helped me, it helped that I'm not technological, is the whole, the whole proposition that it shouldn't be that to create content on the web, you need to be a developer or that you had to learn a specific kind of software. Uh, that didn't make sense to me. And uh, I've always been one to say that, you know, if it can be made for non-developers or non-technical people, then that, that, that is what will succeed because most people will always be non-developers. Uh, so that's what I saw in it. It was admittedly a small investment. It was a, it was a $2, $2 million initial investment with an option for another million. And I had to overcome, still do those kind of deals. <laughs> I had to overcome a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, doubt. Uh, my partners uh, really didn't like it because, um, again, this was there was no traction. I don't mind saying this. The company did not present well <laughs> at the time. Uh, so I have a similar story, by the way, when they came to see me. Um, it was right at this point, and older listeners will appreciate this, when Flash was about to become obsolete and Wix was originally built on Flash. And they walked in and started telling me, oh, don't worry about it, you know, our current platform is going away, but there's a thing called HTML5 that, that we'll just reconstruct everything. And you're going, they didn't really just say that in the presentation, right? That the whole thing is going obsolete, but don't worry, it's going to be okay. And uh, I actually admired the honesty on it, but it was a tough kind of... Oh, they were always very transparent, yeah. right? I mean, I, I, there, are, there are a lot of things I learned from Wix over the years. I mean, they were a magnet for talent. Whenever they saw somebody who was talented, they would find a way to find a position for them. It just didn't matter what the titles were. It was a company that didn't care about titles. They just wanted talent. And so they became a magnet for talent, all types. 
uh, former founders, uh, new ideas. I mean, Monday was was spun out of Wix and all the different products. Um, the second thing was not being afraid to throw away what you've done. I mean, that that move from Flash to HTML, they literally said to one million users, you know, fuck you, <laughs> because we're not going to support you anymore. Um, now, they didn't use that language, of course, but they said, listen, like we we care about the next ten million users, not the la- not the first million. They're not they have nowhere else to go anyway. Uh, they'll they'll figure out a way. We'll make it easy for them to transition. And I realized, you know, that was actually it was a bold move, but like it actually makes sense. Fiverr, Fiverr had traction. Um, Fiverr, when I met it uh, at the time, we were we were measuring websites on Alexa. You remember what Alexa was? I do. When it, when it, okay, Alexa was a was a way of measuring website traffic. Before and, you talked to it, you actually installed a little Alexa <laughs> toolbar. Yeah. Right. It was a toolbar that measured website traffic that yeah. actually Amazon bought and then reused the name. Yeah. But uh, there was a website that just went through the roof overnight. Um, and uh, I, I met I met the founder, Micha, and it, saw what, what they were doing. And I was just astounded that there could be a market for what was at the time $5 uh, services, which, you know, you immediately think about what, what is somebody willing to do for $5? And it was silly at first. It, it really was. A lot of it was silly, but there were some real things. Uh, and I was uh, compelled by just the continuous traction, the momentum that I could see, the volume of transactions and the diversity of transactions and sellers and buyers told me, this is probably going to go for a while. This I have to not- get over the fact that it was like five bucks only and it was in the name Fiverr. It can only be five bucks. And you say, that so was one of the risks. Not everything is going to be five bucks, for God's sake. There's some things that are worth more and worth less. Yeah. And- so you value it, uh, you know, appropriately. And, uh, you know, look, in our business, you know, there's lots of risks. The yeah. question is, can you get comfortable with the risks? Can you eliminate them over time? Uh, that was potential cap on the company's potential. But we knew that there was probably a way to move up over time. And sure enough, pretty much, you know, every quarter, uh, if not every year, the average uh, transaction value kept going up. I don't remember what it is today. I think it's like close to 300 or so. But that, and, and of course, that's the average. So it just shows you, you know, even in the name, <laughs> um, even if their original mission was 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 five, like that that doesn't that need not pin you down. Hand on your heart. How many times did you look at the name Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R, and say, oh my God, we're going to do it those two R's? <laughs> No, <laughs> I wasn't bothered by it at all. No, I, no, they're far worse names. I'm sorry. That, that, all right, give them to me. Which are the far worse names? Uh, I have a whole blog post. Wix on, in Germany. On bad names. Wix in Germany. Yeah, there, look, there are a lot of bad names that are typically they're 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 words that sound like something to an Israeli. Well, give ear. us a couple. No, I'm not going to go into. I'm not, I don't want to accuse anybody. Look, the first name of Monday was the Pulse. The Pulse, and with a D, the Pulse, as if that's what the sounds like to to non. You know, to Israelis, um, and I, every time I would, I would, I would meet uh, um, the founder. I'd say, "Have you changed the name yet?" <laughs> um, and then he, he did. No, I'm not going to get out of here. Which are the other ones? Huh? <laughs> no, not now. You're too well media trained. I need to. I, I need to pick the best ones. I don't have them on the top of my head. So, like Amit Karp, your partner said, you know, I should ask you. Like, you bet on teams and ideas very early. He says, "Where do you get the confidence from to kind of just bet like that?" Bet on a team? Yeah, just a team and an idea. You know, when you've and been I know doing you do this, a lot of that. Yeah, when you've been doing this for so long, you know, uh, you know how, to, you, you know what fails. It's like, it's the, um, it's the inversion technique when you figure out all the ways in which a startup or an entrepreneur is going to fail. And if you don't see any of those signs, there's a good chance that this person or this team can be successful. Uh, I look for certain tr- positive traits also in what entrepreneurs. Are they? Well, it's, I focus primarily on the CEO. Mm-hmm. I look for communication skills. Uh, I look for uh, transparency uh, with me. We, we're going to become partners, essentially. We're not just investors, of course, at that stage. Uh, they need to be able to have to communicate what they're doing in such a way that they can recruit top people, fundraise, sell the product. That's a lot harder than it seems. Uh, I look for somebody at the same time who's sophisticated, who I think, can, as much as they're transparent and a good communicator, can can play a game of poker if if they need to. Um, and then, of course, I look for a very compelling uh, product uh, or and sometimes it's just a market direction where I feel like it's not contrarian. We're actually here kind of, I, I, can th- I think the trend is in their favor over time. 
uh, where it will actually be easier to fundraise with time as opposed to kind of going with, with a headwind. So I also look for entrepreneurs that I think can handle adversity, that realize that the journey they're on is going to be filled with a lot of bumps and, and surprises. Uh, sometimes there's something in their past that suggests they'll be able to handle it. Can you give uh, examples? Look, sometimes it's really tough things in a personal life, right? In, in, including you know, deaths in the family, disease. Um, sometimes it's massive setbacks in their previous venture. It's been, it was shut down, uh, didn't work. Um, that tells me something about their character. You know, it, 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 it's important. Entrepreneur, uh, startups are not easy. If they're easy in the beginning, they're not going to be easy in the end and, and vice versa. And you, and you need that. Uh, I... Uh, I look to get past that initial risk phase from a funding perspective as well, which is not trivial. You know, that Series A, uh, can they get far enough? Is, is, is the domain, is the entrepreneur compelling enough that that additional funding will be straightforward and, and de-risk it? Uh, but do I see the future? Do I really know where it's going? I don't. You've been doing this a long time like I have, and I figured out the right words to ask this question. So, like, you've been to thousands of board meetings at this point. Do you like still enjoy going to board meetings? Do you find them useful? Do you want to be there? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, as an early stage investor, um, I'm typically quite tight with with the team, with the CEO. We have regular conversations, and typically, I know what's going on ahead of the board. In fact, I don't like to come have any surprise at the board, not negative or positive. Um, the board is an opportunity to have a discussion to hear other perspectives that you perhaps hadn't thought of or that hadn't come up in the conversation you have or have had with the CEO. But oftentimes, it's just going through numbers. It's just updates. Uh, and it's not very productive, not a very productive use of, of our time. Do you prefer in-person board meetings or Zoom board meetings? In person. Which means you can't do something else at the same time because you're in person. Correct. But you like it better because you think you can get value from other people in the room? I think I'm able to concentrate a lot more in person. <laughs> Uh, there's something about looking at a screen and having things pop up at you and having ideas. You know, I, whenever I'm sitting doing something, I, I have ideas popping into my head and the urge to look something up on my phone or on the web or to clarify something. It's, you know, that. When you're on a Zoom board meeting, what percentage of the time are you actually paying attention? Sorry, what? I wasn't listening. <laughs> it's not, it's not good. I'm not, I'm not proud of it. Uh, but luckily my enough interaction in between the boards means that I actually know exactly what's going on. Yeah. I, I know something interesting. I, I found the same thing. And so I now take Zoom board meetings uh, without the video because I actually find it, and maybe this is like habit because I'm old. Uh, I, I used to be, I have telephonic board meetings. You all remember the Polycom board meetings before this Polycom video. And I find it easier to concentrate when I'm just on audio than when I'm on video too. I, I completely agree. I don't use a Polycom. Yeah, but, anymore, uh, yeah. I, I put my, my AirPods on and I just walk kind of in circles. I, all conversations are much more effective that way. I, I'm a I do too. I often leave my house if it's an evening then I'll go walk um, because I find it much better. I find also that it actually helps with, with my memory of the same. discussion as well. Same. I find the same thing. But people want to do Zoom board meetings. So what do you do about that? Well, no one wants to travel. Board meetings used to be in, you know, all, all in person. So, yeah. so uh, I, I don't think it's horrible. My problem with Zoom meetings is that people want to do Zoom meetings like instead yeah. of a phone call. Phone calls is, doesn't exist anymore. Um, you and I can talk by phone because the two of us seem to be the only, the only two that want to talk by phone. You can do phone calls if you, if, as if you're in the car. That's the only legitimate excuse these days for doing a phone call rather than a Zoom. I have this new shtick where, you know, everyone, they want a Zoom call. So I get on the Zoom and I go, now that we've said hello, I'm going to put it on. I'm turning off the camera um, so that I can concentrate. And you like, there's this puzzled look on the other side of the Zoom. Like, what, what does he mean? And I say, it's okay, I'm old. You're ahead of me on that. I need to, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take that as a. Why do people want to keep doing Zoom board meetings? Do you invest over Zoom? No, right? No. Did you invest over Zoom during COVID? Once. And? I regret it. Okay. <laughs> How fast did you regret it? It takes time to, to realize you've made a mistake. Um, I'm not sure that's the reason, but I felt very uncomfortable investing in teams over, over Zoom. I also missed many opportunities. So I, I don't, I don't want to blame Zoom. Yeah, I same. found it very hard to establish a rapport with the team um, at that, that period of time. And by the way, it wasn't just that it was on Zoom. 
It was the pace of activity, if you remember. Oh, yeah. That was when there was an accelerant applied to all venture deals to the point where uh, you had to decide within days of meeting a company over Zoom whether you're going to invest. And for those of us who like to truly partner with entrepreneurs in the beginning, that was an impossible thing. To me, it was truly speed dating for marriage. Did you think of retiring at that point? Retiring, no, because, you know, it was like a gold rush. It felt like, because we had portfolios and all of a sudden everything was doing really well and there were exits. It, it, it was it was fantastic in that sense. And no, not, not a retiring, no. I, I, thought I, I thought I was finished, to be honest. I thought, like, I can't keep up with this. It's all these people speed dating over Zoom and, you know, I, I, I can't figure this out. And I, I, I figured that this was going to be what the future might look like. And I was done. The other thing, the other problem I had is that I met all these companies and, uh, you know, six months, 12 months later, I had no recollection that I'd met them. 100%. There's something about meeting somebody on Zoom with that same San Francisco background or whatever background they're using. And, I mean, it's like me, it, it, it was impossible. And it, the odd thing is that I meet them in my office. I remember exactly what chair they sat in, which side, um, who else came to the meeting. Uh, not so much what they were wearing, but exactly that, the dynamic. You just lose that all in Zoom. I interviewed a board member on Zoom yesterday, um, which I also don't like for what it's worth, uh, for one of my companies. And I was completely distracted. I had to stay on Zoom, unfortunately, this one. I was completely distracted by the fact that the logo of the company that the person works for was in the background. And it was it was like one of these virtual backgrounds. And every time the person moved their head and a big head of hair, it, it was like, you know, eating into the logo. Right. And, and some people, I don't some... think I have ADD, but it was like, I couldn't concentrate. There's that. And there's a, uh, before, not everybody was using those backgrounds, but I once had a situation where I had a reporter, uh, one say from one publication that was interviewing me. Um, uh, there, was no, there was no background. She was in her home. Um, and in the middle of the interview, uh, walks in this young man with a towel wrapped around his waist. And of course, she can't see him, but I can see him. <laughs> And I'm in an interview <laughs> trying to answer. And at a certain point, she realized that her son had, walk, had walked in. And you know, <laughs> so, yeah, I prefer in face. Yeah. Know, sort of phone calls. Yeah. My daughter was joking that uh, a uh, podcast interview I did last night on over video would have gone much better had I let my grandson in the room and he could have jumped on my lap. Uh, she thought that would have added a lot of some interest to the conversation. Otherwise, it was boring. Um, things that happen on Zoom. So uh, I have a partner. His name is Tomer. He used to work for you. Uh, great guy. Great guy. But you must have a favorite Tomer story. <laughs> uh, you've caught me here. I don't have a great Tomer story. Um, Tomer was always just so composed and together and kind of mature and wise beyond his years. Um, you know, he's, you know, I don't, I don't have any good, like, silly or embarrassing stories. It's, that's, that's, he didn't walk in a towel on a Zoom or anything No, like I that, yeah. never, I don't have a story like that. No, he, he, he was just a... Uh... So I, I, I want to try something here. So like, there's an entrepreneur who walks in and says, I've only got room for one of the two of you. So after what you explain to them, but really we should do the deal together, you and I, how, how would you com compete against me and say, don't take the olive money, come take the best of money. What's the Adam Fisher pitch? Why do you want Adam Fisher's money? I get a chance to do it like live, like tons of entrepreneurs are going to hear you. Why to take our money? Oh, look, honestly, uh, I think I want what's best for the entrepreneur. Um, there are, I, I think we offer, we have, we have very different personalities, you and I, uh, different approaches. I think uh, Matan Bart would agree with that. Matan Bart, see, of me. Right. And he took, he, 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 <laughs> took us, he took us both. Um, I feel like it's self-selecting. So my view is uh, if you're more comfortable with Michael, go with Michael. All right. We can invest in the next round. I think, um, uh, you know, if you want to go with, if you feel more comfortable with me, you know, go with me. Uh, I just, uh, I don't, I don't like to, uh, okay, so put, let, down, let me, let me to put down others. I, I, I try to, you know, bring us up. Uh, and if that doesn't connect with them, well, then it's probably not the best match anyway. Why should they take one of our money instead of say a foreign investor that comes into Israel? Oh, well, that's easier. All right, good. Um, in the, in the early years, you need somebody local. You need somebody who can meet you face to face, who can really spend time with you. Aside from the help we we, we provide, and you know whether it's recruiting or understanding the market or the idiosyncrasies of of compensation in Israel or uh, 
you know, working with lawyers. Th there's there's something about being present physically and in your time zone in those first 18, 24 months that is, that is priceless. And as we know, as much as uh, foreign VCs, foreigners come to Israel quite often, much more often than they did in the past, they're not here more than once a quarter. And if they are, they have a very busy schedule and you they're not going to spend half a day with you. Yeah. Amit told me also to ask you, what do you think is the biggest misconception foreign investors have about this market? The biggest misconception probably is that all, all the great entrepreneurs come from a certain technology unit. I agree with that. Uh, that that's that, a great point. Yeah. And the second one would be that everybody speaks English. <laughs> Word of truth, my second one is different. I think from the outside, this looks like an endlessly deep market. And it's still a country of like less than 10 million people. And it's not endlessly deep. Right. No, and they see a very high percentage. They don't realize how efficient the market is yes. in terms of surfacing opportunities. Uh, and that's frustrating to a certain extent because it means they can come here for a week and actually meet all of the, a lot of the interesting companies that are fundraising at, at a particular point in time. They figured that out. It's great for the market. I'm not, I'm not against it, obviously. I agree. Uh, but yet they, they do tend to focus on a certain typecast of entrepreneur. Uh, we've seen it with, with Shmona Mataim. Yeah, and with, uh, yeah, yeah, and and uh, and with uh, and in the cyber sectors, and I think when you veer beyond what the, what what has already been proven in Israel, mm -hmm. they're much more skeptical, even cynical. Uh, you asked me about Wix, like Wix was really an impossible thing to get approved when, when it would have been in other funds because there were really no consumer success stories out of Israel except for ICQ, which was never a business. Uh, and there's one thing I've seen over the last two and a half decades, and you have as well, is that there is no domain that Israeli entrepreneurs can't eventually conquer. And we've seen it, you know, there were doubts about consumer, there were then doubts about mobile and cloud infrastructure, truly building a, a cloud. You know, Wix is one of the first yep. companies to build a scalable uh, uh, service. Uh, payments, uh, you know, and fintech, uh, you know, insure tech in your case with, 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 uh, Lemonade. with Lemonade. Um, and so that's what attracts me about the Israeli market, the, the breadth of domains and the ones that have still not yet proven themselves. But for me, I view that as an opportunity, not as a reason to be skeptical or cynical. What was your first success? First investment success? Uh, like as an exit or? Yeah, which company was like the, the first kind of I first exit one... to put you on the map? <laughs> it wasn't a map. Uh, yeah, fair I, enough. It was a yeah. It was a company called Dune Networks. Dune, is that what gave you confidence that you can do this? No, it took me a long time to have confidence. You know, there are people who have confidence, and that makes them successful. And there are others that need to be successful before they have confidence. So I'm the latter. Um, I you know I have a lot of self doubt uh, of what I'm doing at any given in time, given moment in time. It took me many many exits to feel like okay, I think I've got this guy now, and so. I don't know if it was my 10th exit or what exit it was that made me feel like I, I figured it out. But uh, you know, Dune was was a success story because I had sourced it, negotiated it. I mean, it was, it was 25 at the time. Um, and wrote it to an exit and it became actually one of Broadcom's most successful uh, acquisitions ever. Um, and what was spawned, the multiple on capital you returned from that? Uh, it wasn't big. It wasn't big. That's the interesting. But you it, remember it really well. I it remember because it, we, we persevered. It was a, it was a nine year, it took nine years. Uh, but we felt a success along the way. Um, I think it's a critical point that people often miss, right? Which is it's not always the multiple on capital or in your career. It's a sense that I can get through these tough, you know, these ups and the downs of these businesses because there are roller coasters. That, that's right. I mean, I, I think early on I realized that in our business, it's much easier to lose money than people think. Um, and it's very hard at early stage to see those home runs. You, you can't see that. We're not nearly imaginative. We probably also have, don't have the patience to think that far ahead. We're talking about a decade ahead. But what you can do is eliminate the risks and avoid losing money. Um, and I decided to go on, I wouldn't call it low multiple opportunities, but things where I felt like I know how to get to a 3X. And that doesn't sound like great justification for an investment. But my view is that once you're there, you can figure out if there's another 3X in it. And then all of a sudden you're at a nine or 10 X, right? Uh, and so that's been my approach. So when I invested in Wix, I didn't anticipate whatever, five or $10 billion company. 
Um, my best outcome was 500 million. Actually, I was hoping even for 100 million because when you invest at such a low price, it was seven and a half pre, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, the good old days. That's all you needed. Yeah. You know, I always say you, you, if you get points on the board, then you can also lose some in, in another place. But you, you, you have to, uh, you have to figure out how to manage that risk. And uh, uh, I think, I don't know, you, you, you tell me. My feeling is that you're willing to take more risk. You, you, you see, you see opportunity. Um, where I see perhaps too much risk. And that's why I feel like we haven't cooperated as much as as we might have. I, if, just the way I think about it is I'm really good at losing money. Um, and I, I, I'm i okay with all those zeros. And I think one or two or whatever it is will turn out great. And so uh, I don't mind writing them off. I feel bad for the entrepreneurs, but I also think they should get their time back. And that's kind of what I was referencing earlier. So yeah, I... I I don't know if it's more risk tolerance as much as it's, I don't mind the crazy uh, part of this, or I don't mind the, you know, really, really way out there entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm looking for very, very small propensity to have an outcome, but if the outcome is there, it's very large. I respect that. And I love that. It's, yeah. it's necessary. I mean, I, I've done it on occasion. I do think that Wix and, and no Fiverr question. were those crazy opportunities that you could not explain logically. I need to do more of them. <laughs> so, Roni Zahavi said, I should ask you this question. I think it's a really great one. He's founder of Hi Bob. By the way, he insisted on saying, send regards. Um, he, he said, uh, what is your recommendation to private companies when it comes to the geopolitical tensions that exist now? And it's for said a different way. He said, what comes first, company or country? And I don't think, by the way, they're dichotomous for what it's worth. I wanted to say that up front. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm trying to think of a situation in which I'm, Favoring my con- my company over the country, um, maybe it's from a perception standpoint. You know, I think um, the, I think the country will be fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the The country's not going to go bankrupt because of a bad rap. I, I think a company can, if, it, if, if maybe that's what he was getting at. Uh, I've been I've, I've been on the opinion that we perhaps took the Israel startup nation story a little bit too far, and it's unnecessary. At this I point. agree with that. I don't think we need to market Israel's high tech. It's doing fine without it. Um, I can't think of another country that markets its business community the same way. We don't really think of most products we buy as Swiss or Swedish or Dutch. It's just not that important. And I think we need to get used to not always referring to our companies as Israeli companies. I don't think the venture ecosystem needs to pound its chest the way it has um, we've reached the stage of success where, like, just just look at the results. You want to make money, you know, you're, you're welcome to invest. I just don't think we need to market ourselves the same way we we have over the last decade. Yeah, it's funny. I, I think the startup nation moniker is problematic. I do think there's a certain amount of national pride in you know America Inc. and in Israel. I don't like the startup nation thing. I think it was great for a period. I don't think it's great for now. As kind of this leader in innovation, I think is super valuable. It is. I, but again, I think. Great companies are funded. Sure. I, I, I don't think there's any problem with uh, with good companies continuing to get funded or being dismissed by customers as not being serious. There was a time, and you remember this, when businesses in the U.S., especially in Europe, they wouldn't buy from a company outside of their home territory, let alone Israel. That sounded to them very sketchy. It's just not an issue anymore. The world is far more interconnected. There's much more acceptance of not even asking where the salesperson is calling from, or where that website is actually, uh, you know, domiciled. It's just not. It's just not interesting. And so I, I, I just don't think it's important. So maybe to Ronnie's question, like I, I'm fine with our companies, kind of not raising the Israeli flag and just co- considering themselves international companies. Last two questions, since we deal a lot with values on this podcast, just being like. Um, I open with that question. So you're on the board of Beit Issy Shapiro. And I'm interested in like, what drew you to that cause? What motivates you to be there? And uh, you should tell us about it also because it does important work. So actually, I'm no longer on the board. I was on the board, I think, for seven years. Um, I'm still active there um, in other ways. Um, uh, Beit Issy Shapiro is a, um, uh, they do a lot of things, but they essentially focus on children with disabilities. Um, from the most severe disabilities to 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 light ones, very young children, um, kind of the pre the preschool kind of years, uh, um, and uh, 
They're the first of its kind in Israel. Um, and they had a huge impact on uh, the disabled community in Israel, in particular children, how the government treats them, the rights they deserve. And they've actually exported a lot of their ideas and thoughts and, and training to other countries around the world, um, both in the, in the Middle East, but also in Europe uh, and in Asia. And so they've had an, an enormous impact. I got involved because my 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 youngest son um, uh, went there at age six months, which for us was a godsend. Uh, he was born with a very severe, very rare neurological disease um, that made him essentially unable to do pretty much anything. Um, no very no cognitive function. I can't even say very limited. Um, and uh, and they took him with open arms, and. Uh, you know, this is where I thank myself for choosing to live in Israel. I know some places like that exist in the U.S., but the kind of personal warmth we received, uh, it was just incredible. The rights he received as an Israeli citizen, despite the fact that he couldn't communicate in any form. And so, uh, you know, my family said, we're going we're gonna to be involved and truly give back. And so that's what we do. Amazing. You know, I first ran into them. You mentioned the consumer uh, industry before. So Nahum Sharfman of blessed memory, who was an early father of Israeli high tech. He was at National Semiconductor. And then he started this company that became shopping.com uh, that I was invested in uh, in the late 90s and into the early 2000s. Um, was very, very involved there and took me there mm. on a number of occasions. Nahum unfortunately passed away in a, in a plane accident. Um, but then it like dropped off my radar until kind of getting, doing the research uh, for this episode. So, you know, thank you for the yeah, work. It's an incredible It's an amazing place. institution. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just, it's also a sign of, it's a show, it was, it itself was an entrepreneurial venture um, in the name of, of Izzy Shapiro. Uh, but it also shows like uh, what Izzy was capable of even beyond high tech. Yeah, people don't realize, by the way, but they're in the nonprofit sector in Israel. You have this in the Feuerstein Center in Jerusalem. You have it in Beit Izzy Shapiro. You have it in Yad Sara, which distributes free medical equipment uh, across the country and saves the country, by the way, billions and billions of dollars in in medical costs and Zichron Menachem in Jerusalem for uh, cancer patients. Um, the nonprofit sector, particularly around health services uh, for populations, is actually an area of IP export that is underappreciated in this country. And to your point, you know, it's all over the world, whether it's Middle East or Southeast Asia or Europe, it's uh, people are not even aware of what, what incredible work is done here in that. In that There's area. incredible innovation. I think the only thing that's ha, has been lacking, I think it's changed, is just uh, uh, the Israeli citizens' approach to supporting and, and helping nonprofits financially, not just with their time. Yeah, I agree with that. Last question for you from Tomer Tagren of Yatpo. Um, and I'm going to quote it. He says, how do you manage to deal with your level of success and stay so grounded and humble? Um, he thinks that one of the most unique things about you is that nothing goes to your head. How do you how do you pull that off? It helps to have self doubt to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, failure is just around the corner all the time, um, or other types of challenges. As successful as you've been, uh, you know you've also had a lot of privilege, and uh, privilege may come from come the family you were born into or the country you're born in. Um, or whatever the opportunities you were given, it also comes from not having had to deal with horrible things. You know, after October seventh, I think you realize what people deal with. And, you know, so I've I've just always been very conscious of uh, of how lucky I am, um, and uh, whether it's in business or 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 in life, and uh, and not to let it get in my head. A lot of what we do feels like it feels like it was scripted. Or, or, or we know exactly how it's going to end up. We, we, we didn't, right? I mean, uh, there's a lot, lot out of our control. Not only just the macro, but even the micro. Even people. We're dealing with individuals who things happen to them as well um, that are unforeseen, and you have no control over. And so you have to accept that. Uh, and when you accept that, I think you realize how much luck is involved in success. Because in my opinion, um, luck is is just the absence of bad luck. Um, and when you understand that, you realize, look, don't let it get to your head. Um, be 
be grateful. Um, move on to the next one. Thank you for doing this, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about Adam, check him out on X, and I highly recommend you check him out on X. Uh, at Adam R. Fisher, that's A-D-A-M-R-F-I-S-H-E-R. And if you like the podcast, rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, subscribe, wherever you can find us. I really appreciate you doing this, Adam. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you, Michael.